South Africa, June 1995. It was the calm before the storm. The All Blacks taking time out to relax just prior to the third Rugby World Cup. Get in the hole! Get in the hole! Get in! Get in! But this entire All Black squad would soon ready itself to sell out the Silver Fern and prepare to walk away from the hundred-year-old All Black heritage. This is the story of how two entrepreneurs almost pulled off the sporting coup of the century, taking the All Blacks with them. And how at the 11th hour, they were stopped. It's the story of how All Black Rugby went professional during three dramatic weeks in the middle of 1995. The issue of paying players was a ticking time bomb. As far back as 1924, All Blacks had been complaining about the hardships they endured on tour representing their country. Even the great George Nepia had been forced to go to England to play rugby league just to feed his family back on the East Coast. All sorts of schemes had been dreamed up by successive generations of All Blacks to make money. But by 1995, the issue had come to a head. And in that World Cup year, an organisation called the World Rugby Corporation, the WRC, was to finally force the issue of All Blacks and money out into the open. These mock-up posters, never seen before, were prepared in secret by the WRC as it geared up to take over the running of international rugby and turn the rugby world on its head. They're a testament to how close the 1995 All Blacks came to walking away from the All Black institution and tradition. The World Rugby Corporation came out of Australia. It was the brainchild of South African-born rugby-mad Sydney lawyer and dealmaker Jeff Levy. Levy dreamed of a completely new international rugby competition better than the World Cup, with rugby stars like the Jonah Lomus of the world bringing in a truly global television audience to spice up the game he'd loved and followed all his life. Jonah would, was an important factor, as was a, um, any other star in any team, because he was, he, was of he was of international significance from a purely financial point of view, if you think about it. If you've got a key sponsor, he was a face that was now recognised around the world. Basher. This new competition with the elite players featuring would be worldwide and professional and give greater control to the players. He's only got one to beat. They've got it again. I don't believe this. He's got it up the cross Amidst great secrecy, Jeff Levy sold his idea of a new international rugby circus to Australian media magnate Kerry Packer. WRC, the World Rugby Corporation, would give Packer another weapon in his fight with arch-rival Rupert Murdoch over Rugby League, which Packer had and Murdoch wanted. During 1995, Murdoch was trying to wrest control of Rugby League by setting up a rival competition which he called Super League. Yeah, I'm just looking at the our investments. A global fight between these Australian media giants, Rupert Murdoch and Kerry Packer, was about to begin. The man chosen by Jeff Levy to sell the dream of Packer's WRC rugby circus to the players was Ross Turnbull. Turnbull was a wallaby prop in his playing days when he went by the nickname of Mad Dog. Now he was to be the main WRC strategist. There was two phases to it. Firstly, you had to per persuade the players. And I, th I believe that once the players were persuaded, we could then deal with the officials. The officials were saying the game was amateur, but it was clearly sham amateur. So there was a problem in the perception of the players about officials. <clears throat> the officials, from their point of view, all good men, because I'd worked with many of them over the years, but take them out of their managing directorships and senior officials, et cetera, et cetera. When they talked about rugby, their prime motive, and I'm saying with great respect, but you could say it as an illustration, was where they parked their car, where they sat in relation to the president, the president's box, where the next airfare was coming to take their wives to the test match. Uh, because it was very much a part-time occupation, so it was, we were seriously invading their territory. So the players were looking at it from an international perspective, and the officials generally were looking at it from a selfish perspective. 
placing greater control of the game in the hands of the players was a tantalizing prospect for the 1995 All Blacks, as it was for the former All Black turned professional talent agent, Andy Hayden. I was a liaison point for the WRC here in New Zealand. Um, and I certainly talked to a lot of players of, uh, about the concept and uh, a lot of All Blacks at the time. Very enthusiastic. For years, rugby players like Andy Hayden had felt ripped off by the men who ran the game, the administrators. The players did all the work, the administrators got the perks. Something had to change. And that sentiment was to provide fertile ground for the WRC. It could not have launched itself at a better time. No one knows that better than Peter Fitzsimons. Fitzsimons is an ex-Wallaby lock and columnist and writer for the Sydney Morning Herald. You're getting interest? This year, he joined me on TV One's rugby talk show, Tight Five. He followed this story closely. Fitzsimons characterises what happened throughout 1995 to Southern Hemisphere rugby as a war. On one side of your war, you had your Blazer Brigade, your rugby establishment, and they were under attack because what had happened was Rupert Murdoch had launched Super League. And what Super League was, was get all these league players, put them into our own competition, we will pay them three and four and five times what they've previously been paid. What this meant was, for rugby, was anybody that had any talent whatsoever, <coughs> they'd just take them, OK? So every rugby team in, in the world that had serious players would be denuded of all these players. Rugby realised the only way we can possibly protect our patch when they're using, they're paying these blokes their telephone numbers, we're going to have to start to pay the money. We're concerned about the Super League. Uh, it's, it's a new angle to an old the problem. In New Zealand, the Blazer Brigade was led by Richie Guy, then the chairman of the New Zealand Rugby Football Union and a former All Black himself. In early 1995, he had a problem, how to keep the All Blacks away from Rugby League. When Super League first uh, started to threaten us, I spoke to several of the experienced players and I said, I don't want you to talk to your friends, but please uh, give me an idea of how much money you think we would need to get together to retain the All Blacks as an identity. And they came up with uh, roughly the same amount of money, uh, so it may seem by today's standards, and it was considered that if they got about $150,000 per annum, that would be sufficient to keep them away from Super League. Of course, WRC came up with much bigger numbers than that, and obviously that's what set the trend for today's salary standards. For months in the lead up to the 95 World Cup, there was a phony war. WRC man Ross Turnbull had secretly begun talking to the world's top rugby players who were keen. But coincidentally, the Blazer Brigade, the men from the rugby unions in New Zealand, Australia and South Africa, had also secretly begun their moves to protect their players. Things began to move with surprising speed. Amidst great secrecy of their own, the Southern Hemisphere Rugby Unions, under the banner of Sanzar, came up with a new Tri-Nations competition which they could sell to a broadcaster and then pay real money to their star players, the All Blacks and Wallabies and Springboks. It was Ian Frickberg, a Kiwi connection, who made it happen. He introduced the unions to the real money. Frickberg then put the Southern Unions together with another expat Kiwi, Sam Chisholm, Rupert Murdoch's right-hand man. The Southern Hemisphere Unions elected South Africa's Louis Late to do a deal with the volatile Chisholm. Dr. Louis Late is the hugely wealthy and influential businessman and rugby administrator who also just happens to own the Cathedral of South African Rugby, Alice Park, venue for much of the 1995 Rugby World Cup. Why to Lomu? He's got the bounce. At the World Cup, Jonah Lomu exploded onto the world stage. Lomu! Oh, oh. On June the 18th in the semi-final against England, this single try convinced Rupert Murdoch and his money men there were huge entertainment dollars to be made out of rugby union. But they had to have Jonah Lomu and everything that went with them. The All Blacks, the Springboks and the Wallabies. Sam Chisholm immediately summons Louis Late to London for a secret meeting in which hundreds of millions of dollars would be on the table. Murdoch was in London. They wanted to do a deal. I had to be in uh, London on the Monday. So I had to make all sorts of excuses. I couldn't tell the 
Five Nations guys where I was going. And off I went that Sunday night to arrive in uh, London uh, the Monday morning and straight to uh, Sam's f apartment and uh, into negotiations. You would think, would you not, that a deal with the Australian, South African and New Zealand rugby unions for 555 million American dollars lasting 10 years, you would think that a deal, a contract that had that stuff written on it, you would think you would put it in a room and you'd have a battalion of Murdoch lawyers on one side, you'd have a battalion of lawyers from the rugby unions on the other, and they'd go at it for 10 weeks. Hunt, doggy, hunt. Go through every clause, every paragraph. And what it actually was, was in Sam Chisholm, this is Murdoch's right-hand man in London, in his, on his dining room table with his one lawyer, Bruce McWilliam, with a computer and a printer, and Louis Late from there representing the rugby unions, bashing it out over 45 minutes. And they... Uh, they came up with this contract, which, you know, promised that they'd have the unions were with, with Rupert Murdoch. And so Murdoch was totally, totally committed to it because he's got all this money, all this front. The irony, of course, being that in rugby league, Murdoch was the rebel. He was the one that was snaffling them in the night. In rugby union, he emerges as the establishment. The very next day, Louis Late was back in South Africa. The Rugby World Cup was still in progress. No one knew he'd even been gone. The deal Louis Late signed on behalf of the Springboks, the All Blacks and the Wallabies was for 555 million US dollars over 10 years. An unbelievable amount of money for a previously amateur sport. The rugby unions were delighted, of course, because it meant they could keep their players out of the clutches of rugby league and super league. But at this stage, they were still completely unaware of the WRC bearing down on them. We were very satisfied with the money. Uh, we could see our way clear to uh, uh, con contain the players, re retain the players. And so we were, we were quite happy with the money. So I think even by today's standards, it's still a very good deal. So the day before the final of the 1995 World Cup, this amazing deal, which would change the face of international rugby, was announced by the three Southern Hemisphere rugby unions. For some time, rugby union uh, has appeared to be threatened by the codes, almost like an injured impala limping into the bushveld with lines nearby. Today, I think those old handicaps have been removed. Come the morning, the day before the World Cup final, there's this press conference at Ellis Park. The three wise men file in, Louis late in the middle, and he's got this press thing. And, he, and we're, there's all these assembled journalists not knowing what, what's going to be happening. And he reads it in this sort of very sort of deadpan. It is not. Drum roll, please. Here it is. It is. Uh, no, 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 no. And uh, 555 million American dollars. And, you know, this whole thing of all the journalists, this thunderclap of there's this sort of deadpan, thick South African accent reading through these words. And what it actually means is rugby is professional. Richie Guy was there that day, but he knew that even with the money to pay players, the unions couldn't underestimate the ongoing threats from outside. It was the end of step one. I mean, the, the, the process, of course, was one of retaining the players, and so having got the money didn't mean to say we'd retained the players. And from our original, uh, whilst we could certainly see off Super League with the, with the type of money we had, we didn't know what sort of money at that point um, WRC was offering. Um, and so it was really, a, it was happy because we'd, we'd got the money, that was the, the first, but it was only the first step. The second step, of course, was to re-sign the players. And surely that would be an easy job. After all, here was a rock-solid international competition announced involving the All Blacks, the Springboks and the Wallabies that had real money to pay and reward All Black stars like Jonah Lomu and Sean Fitzpatrick. While on the face of it, the WRC plan looked dead in the water at that point, people didn't bank on the determination of the Aussie battler, Ross Turnbull. What should have been the end of the rugby war was only the beginning. 1995 Rugby World Cup. It's over! Triumph for the Rainbow Nation!
position. And this would be the last time Louis Leight and Springbok captain Francois Pina were to embrace Steve Tsweti, the Minister of Sport, that has a handshake. Because over the next few weeks, these two men were to become bitter enemies. Francois Pina. At the heart of their argument was the amount of money being offered to the Springboks, the Wallabies and the All Blacks by the World Rugby Corporation. And I first of all thought it was a fairy tale, but I was, I was definitely willing to listen. People were going to pay us so much money to play for them. Um, it's just ludicrous to say no. It profoundly offended oh, Louis Leight that Pinar didn't say no, because to Dr. Leight, the Springbok jersey was not for sale to the World Rugby Corporation, especially now he had just negotiated the Murdoch deal, which was firmly in place. You see, they were fairly clever. They owned in on the front of Pinar. And... Uh, and I couldn't understand that man because I really brought him through as a youngster right through and he was well taken care of. His studies and everything. He was a really well off guy at the time. And I couldn't believe it that France would betray us. It became obvious to everyone that the first rule of rugby politics still holds. And that rule is who is most powerful on the field is most powerful off the field. And so when you had this this fight, it was obvious we need the Springboks. They are the incumbent world champions. If you're going to have two competitions here, whoever's got the Springboks wins. If you ain't got the Springboks, you're kidding. When the cheering had died down just hours after the Springbok victory, the argument over the value of the All Blacks was to enter Sean Fitzpatrick's life. The occasion was the post-match World Cup celebratory dinner in Johannesburg. And before we went to the final dinner, uh, Richie Guy, then, uh, then chairman of uh, New Zealand Rugby Union had said, you know, that they'd signed this deal with Murdoch and um, the players were going to earn X amount of dollars and uh, I said, well, that's great, that's fantastic. And then we went to the dinner and uh, Henny LaRue came up to me and said, oh, have you heard about this professional rugby business? And I said, yeah, yeah, we just went to it. And he said, yeah, we're going to earn this much a year and it was like three or four times what Richie Guy had just told me, like, Oh, that's a bit strange. <laughs> We're obviously uh, on a different different contract, and, and that's uh, I walked away not not realising he's talking about WRC. With the World Rugby Corporation promising paychecks worth many times more than the rugby administrators were offering under the Murdoch deal, it was obvious the players were going to listen. We sat down as a team, and it was sort of decided that we would all stick together and, and promote this WRC. But it wasn't necessarily that straightforward for the World Rugby Corporation. They weren't the only people trying to throw huge sums of money at the All Blacks during the middle of 1995. In fact, I'm prepared to say the whole, maybe some, maybe one or two, with one or two exceptions, the whole back line squad that went to the World Cup had, had Australian Rugby League contracts, which they were about to sign. And that's what we were competing against. But what Fitzy did is he didn't, because they, he didn't say, OK, you can sign those guys, keep them up to the rugby league. He used them as leverage for some of the boys who he knew might not get such a great contract. And let me tell you something that's very admirable. And he was an absolute gentleman, true to his word, never once was two-faced right through this whole process. Straightforward, upfront. Very impressive. What's your job? Get Sean Fitzpatrick and um, all the senior New Zealand players uh, in a very professional manner. We're a most impressive group of people to do it. As a matter of fact, it was interesting in dealing with them because <coughs> we dealt with all the teams and basically the teams that did best you know, at, 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 in the World Cup was reflected in our business dealings with them. Teams like South Africa and New Zealand were superb to deal with. France was superb to deal with. Um, uh, Australia was difficult to deal with. Uh, they didn't seem to have the same organisation that those earlier teams had. July the 5th, 1995, soon after the World Cup final, the All Blacks were back in Wellington at a parliamentary reception. The All Black contracts had run out. They were no longer tied to the New Zealand Rugby Football Union. They were free agents. After the uh, World Cup final, uh, we met with the players and I told them that we had secured the money, or well, that would have been public knowledge anyway, and that, um, you know, that we would be able to uh, offer them 
salaries commensurate with what the figures they've been talking. In other words, that $150,000 per annum. Um, it was pretty clear to me, although nobody said anything, that uh, something was going on because they didn't all rush up and say, well, we'll sign up now. The reason there were no signatures? Well, Jonah Lomu and the rest of the All Blacks, immediately following the parliamentary reception, snuck away to a meeting at this Wellington hotel where they met the number one man from the World Rugby Corporation. Jeff Levy had just flown in from Sydney to meet the full squad behind closed doors. And I had to kind of, you know, give the, what, the coach speech, you know. <laughs> this is the dream, you know, this is the vision sort of thing and tell them all about it. I was actually sitting down the back listening to my Walkman more than anything else. I started to notice Jonah Loma taking off his headphone. I thought, ah, we now have their attention, you see. And it was very interesting. What we did is we then said to them um, to go forward from here, in which we can then negotiate contracts and even let you more into the plan. You have to sign confidentiality agreements with us. You know, what a lot of people didn't know is that um, I think um, I would have been the only one in the whole crew that went into that room that didn't sign on the on the dotted line, actually, you know, the very first day we went in. And they each one came and signed, and I'll never forget a very large forward whom I just don't want to mention names because I'm, I'm under confidentiality, but, you know, if, if I can, I'd be happy to mention names. He put his head right in front of my face, and he said to me, I want one of those things to sign, and I just about shitting myself in my pants, uh, said to him, well, you know, you've, you've actually signed one. I want to sign another one. So I said, well, this, you know, it's only a confidentiality agreement. Grab the pen on my hand, give me one to sign. <laughs> and he signed another one, but uh, it was a very interesting experience. By now, a couple of weeks later, in mid-July 1995, the All Blacks were in Sydney to prepare for the Bledisloe Cup. At this point, the team negotiations with WRC were complete and it was time for the All Blacks to finally commit to the Rebel organization once and for all. Almost to a man, they were ready to do so. The New Zealand Rugby Union still had no idea that their star players were about to fly the coop. Coach Laurie Maines did know, and this created a huge conflict for him. I was continually getting questioned by the media uh, about this WRC, and it was just a situation where everybody had agreed they would neither confirm nor deny when it came to contracts and all those sort of things and it really just put me on a spot i felt terribly uncomfortable about it and was by the day becoming more and more alienated by now the new zealand rugby union was aware of the wrc but they didn't yet realize what a threat that posed all they knew was they had to re-sign the players immediately because without the players the 555 million dollar murdoch deal was a dead duck the Murdoch organisation was putting the heat on the New Zealand Rugby Union to deliver the players as they'd contracted to do. So the Rugby Union was in crisis. So cometh the hour, cometh the man, and the man was Jock Hobbs. Hobbs was ideally placed to represent the All Black establishment. He was a lawyer, a member of the NZRFU Council, and a former All Black captain. And his job was to fight a last-ditch stand to save the game he loved. I, I don't think that I actually saw it as a war, um, because it's, it wasn't a war in the true sense, obviously, of that word. But it was, you know, this was a race that had a lot on it. And if he got second, there, was, there were no prizes. Hobbs was dispatched to Sydney, where he quickly came to the realisation that the All Blacks had committed instead to the World Rugby Corporation deal. In Sydney, he met with Murdoch's right-hand man, Sam Chisholm. Chisholm was jumping up and down, demanding that the three Southern Hemisphere rugby unions deliver the players for the new Murdoch deal. Later, at this Sydney hotel, Hobbs had the distinctly unpleasant task of reporting back to a specially convened meeting of the New Zealand Rugby Football Council. And the enormity of what the NZRFU was facing was obvious to me. And at that meeting, I tried to communicate that by saying that, saying to the, to the council that um, I sincerely believe that this may well be the last meeting 
of the NZR if you counsel of any significance.